I find a ton of inspiration just outside the normal world of gear. I mean, that stuff is fascinating. Looking at new gear and looking at the things that everyone's creating is, is inspiring in its own way. But my main inspiration, and I feel like it ties into both Terry and I, is just it's larger than the world of gear. It's kind of the world of sound in general, whether it's soundtracks or different like moods, different albums, different atmospheric stuff. Um, to me, connecting and building algorithms I like, you know, expanding the palette. There's, 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 we have all these colors available to us. We go in and, and, and search out different gear. And for me, what inspires me the most is really taking an outside influence and then expanding that palette for everybody. So everyone can paint with new colors when they're making their tracks. Even as much as playing guitar, I, I loved the gear from day one. I was just fascinated. I was really into the rack effects that were popular at the time. Um, I couldn't afford a whole lot of them, but I was really into figuring out how they worked, which algorithms made which sounds. So as soon as I got to school, I quickly decided like, okay, I'm going to do electrical engineering. I'm going to figure out how this stuff works and really quickly started focusing on DSP classes with the aim of making effects. Just distortion pedal was my first thing that I ever built. You know, the Craig Anderton book, I built the tube sound fuzz. Um, I blew it up three times before it ever worked. The first thing I made, and it was really teaching myself how to solder, was making um, an asymmetrical uh, distortion pedal where you could switch the different waveforms in the positive and negative half of the wave, and you can mix and match different clipping. And, and as soon as I got MATLAB and all the different resources that were available, on the computer science, electrical engineering side, then I was just like living inside that world. I begged a local repair guy, Pat Bewley, to um, let me work in his shop. And after about a week, he said yes. And uh, I was just the, so grateful for that opportunity. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. I was excited to go to work every day. I was only 16. At first, I was only working a couple hours a day after school. And then that job went on for a few years until I was uh, Really, really lucky to get a job at Line 6. And while I was going to college, I got the opportunity to actually join the engineering department, which is a dream come true. My girlfriend and I, we have this opportunity to visit some family in California, but I stopped along the way, driving up and down the West Coast. I stopped at DigiDesign, and I also stopped at Line 6. And I was really lucky to catch um, one of the founders just kind of on a downtime. And we bonded over Zappa and we, you know, I explained what I was doing in school. And um, so it was really immediate, like I graduated and then moved out to start at Line 6. While at Line 6, that's where I got to meet Terry, which was a really, you know, amazing thing to have happen because we connected right away um, on all different levels. On gear, we were really interested in like 80s rat gear, especially the stuff that um, the police were using. I would ask him questions. Hey, what's you know what's Andy Summers using on, on this part of Omega Man or something like that? And, and Angelo would know. He knew everything about effects. So, yeah, Andy Summers was definitely an inspiration gear-wise, of just like how far you could push the things that people were making. Around 2007, I started getting the itch to do something that were that was my design that was um, that I had more creative input into rather than just being an engineer working on it so Gina and I talked about it and she was really supportive and and she designed the Strymon logo in our two bedroom apartment and uh, we kind of started it off that way just really ground level and then um, joined up with some friends later that helped us to really boost the brand and and make pedals end of 2012 it was it was just time for me to do something else again so um, that was when the idea for Maris sprouted. Terry had some clear ideas of the things that he wanted to do and and Terry and Gina had already been working on um, art blogs and really establishing their own unique voice and I was really attracted to that they did some really amazing looking things together and I'm like oh that's pretty compelling <laughs> and at the time at line six we were working on the helix and so it was this push and pull. It's like, oh, I like working on the Helix. That's pretty fun too. But I don't know, Terry and Gina are making some really cool stuff. And Terry had already 
uh, been working on the preamp, but then yeah, in 2014, we started full-fledged January making 500 series stuff. Yeah, that's kind of how Maris started, just with, you know, two of my best friends in the world, you know, being able to have the opportunity to work together again. You know, all the way in the beginning got me so hooked in, all of that rack gear and stuff by Lexicon and Eventide. They had an uncompromising approach to audio that you didn't always get in pedals. And the 500 series was definitely an opportunity for that. We had, you know, just, you know, uh, the ability to select the cleanest, you know, converters and like the best, most broadband signal path and like just making it pristine. And that's really what brought us in that direction. And we saw an opportunity in the 500 series. There's such an amazing opportunity there for you know, processing either, um, you know, long side recording or before recording. And it being modular, it really kind of spoke to kind of our pedal board roots too. It was like, oh man, that's kind of the pedal board in the studio. And so there's really some excitement around that. I had started by buying a lunchbox and started designing the micro like pretty much right away. And then I didn't see any signal processing stuff happening there in that space. So I thought that there was a big gap and maybe maybe people would appreciate something different, which it turns out they did, with the, especially with the reverb. And yeah, the 500 series was uh, and is a good platform for, for the new emerging studio where mixing consoles aren't so ubiquitous, but people still want a lot of outboard. That's kind of the space we we're trying to fit in there. I really like, you know, seeing how Terry and Gina react to certain sounds. Um, I mean, that was a big part of the Mercury 7 500 series development. If I could make Gina smile and Terry smile, it's like, oh, we're going in the right way. <laughs> and then personally, if, if I can just lose myself in playing with whatever it is, then I'm like, oh, okay, I just spent an hour playing through this algorithm. I think I'm getting closer. <laughs> they were asking us, well, how do I put this on my pedal board? It's like, and for us, it was just a logical evolution to, to um, create a pedal platform after that. That was quite a bit different than the 500 series stuff, but careful to maintain the, the level of audio integrity on the ground as opposed to in the rack. Yeah, it was a very slow, humble start, but I think it always is when you're, when you're starting something new. So the driving force behind the look of Maris is Gina. She, she always had a very clear vision of where she wanted things to go exploring the things that we loved. So exploring sci-fi and exploring art and exploring really technical things and branching off to new ideas. The website, videos, logos, uh, packaging, every form of artwork is super lucky to have her. Everything that we make, everything that we develop is all built in Southern California. It's all California origin and that's really important for us too. We like having the relationships with everyone and we like being able to, you know, collaborate with all those different local businesses that, you know, help us do what we do. But in this building, it's, it's pretty much research design and graphic development. We always wanted to make sure that what we were creating felt not like an accessory or an effect, but uh, felt like an instrument. So we wanted to make sure that was integral to your production or music creating process. The second part was that every product needed to have a concept. So usually we start with a concept and then start developing the product from there. So for example, Mercury 7 was all based on the Blade Runner soundtrack, how that sounded, how that felt. Uh, we loved Vangelis. We loved the reverb sounds on that soundtrack. We loved the synthesizers. So we wanted to recreate that vibe in an instrument and a product. Everything that we do, as soon as it doesn't feel authentic, I mean, it's not even considered, it's not even on the table. If something isn't true to who we are or doesn't fit with our own kind of, you know, past and future of what we love and our tastes, then it's not even interesting. We really want to you know, just kind of keep pushing the limits of what's available um, and really offer new sounds, but sounds that come personally from us, you know. So it's, it's yeah, it's very much a personal thing. <laughs>